Well, good morning. Uh, just as Tom said, I do appreciate uh, Debbie McDaniel and her husband Roger and how the great work they do in the senior adults ministry. Tom said, if you know, if you're not sure if that, you know, if you quite qualify or you can be part of that, you can stop by and talk to Debbie. You can certainly do that. You can also ask yourself, am I as old or older than Tom Cruisenberry? And if you're Tom's age, then you're able to go on those trips because Tom is, uh, has reached that spot. He's up in the booth. Love you, buddy. Uh, <laughs> love you. Uh, above, the, above the doors of the sanctuary in the church where I grew up hung this picture of Christ. You may have seen it before. It's, it's fairly popular, kind of made the, the rounds. Some have called it Jesus' senior picture. He has uh, coiffed hair, dons a well-ironed robe. You know, he's looking all dapper and serious. If he just had like a letterman's jacket thrown over the chair, yeah, he'd fit in almost any high school in America. And that, of course, is not the most culturally sensitive depiction of Jesus. You can find images that are much truer to life like this. Um, there's another second image that I have here that was a, a scientific rendering. A couple years ago, a group kind of figured out like, hey, can we recreate what Jesus may have looked like? This is what they uh, had come up with. And then of this third one is taken from uh, the popular streaming series on the Gospels called The Chosen. And each of those uh, images gets us closer to Reality, but the picture we're going to see of Jesus today from Revelation chapter 1 gets us even more to the core of who he is. This picture is one that makes us really stand up and take notice. Uh, it's one that demands uh, our attention. It's one that we can be confident in. Uh, it's one really that elicits worship. And so if it's true that a picture tells a thousand words, the one we're going to see today offers us a bit of an encyclopedia. Like it gives us a lot about Christ but it's a perspective on Jesus that we in the world desperately need. And so I'm really excited to look at it with you today. If you are joining us for the first time ever or first time in a long time, uh, I wanna say welcome. We are in week two of this teaching series through the book of Revelation. That's how we're starting 2023. And last week, if you missed this, just a very quick recap. We saw Revelation is not just one type of writing, it's actually four types of writing. Revelation, we're told in the opening verses, is a letter. So it was written to, to seven real churches in the first century. We need to keep that in mind as we talk about how do we interpret the book and what does it mean for us. We have to ask, well, what did it first mean for them because it was originally written to these churches and believers in the first century? So as we discern what it meant for them, we have a better way of saying what does it mean now for us. Revelation is a letter. It's also a testimony. We saw that it, it's encouraging Christians to stay faithful to Jesus even if that faithfulness proves costly. And so testimony in our day often means sharing you know, how you came to be saved or how you came to faith. But in that day, it was much more um, sticking your neck on the line for Christ, like making a public witness is in a court of law. So you're standing up for what you believe to be true, even if it's going to cost you something. That's what Revelation is encouraging believers to do. It's a letter, a testimony. It is an apocalypse. Uh, the Greek word for Revelation is apocalypsis. That's where we get the word apocalypse. And apocalypse is a type of writing that uses symbols and imagery in order to communicate spiritual realities. So it's using a lot of you know, vivid images to try to show us what's happening kind of underneath the, the surface. And so we said we need to be aware of that going in so we can begin to make sense of what we see. And then Revelation is also forth a prophecy. And so it speaks some to the, the future, and we'll talk about that when we get to those Places, But like most biblical prophecy, it deals first and foremost with really kind of offering a critique of the, of the current cultural moment, of what those churches were going through in that first century. And so um, it is these four things, the first four verses tell us it's these types of writings that informs our whole reading of the book. And we ended last week's message in verse 9 with an introduction of the author. This is uh, John, who was a disciple of Jesus, and he says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So he's been faithful to Christ, and because of that, he's suffered. He's kind of a prisoner on this island uh, in the Aegean Sea. And while he's there, he receives four uh, visions. Now, Revelation, it's one story. It's one revelation that he receives, but there are kind of these four main parts and uh, the first one we're going to look at today, but vision number two starts in chapter four. He's, he's carried up in the spirit up into heaven. He sees a vision of God's throne, the throne room. 
And while he's there and he's looking at the throne, we see worship in chapter four and chapter five. And then we see uh, seven seals and seven trumpets and seven bowls. This is the longest of the four visions in the book. It stretches all the way from chapter four to the end of chapter 16. So a lot of the things that people think about when they think of Revelation, beast and dragons and uh, 666, it all takes place in the second vision from the throne room of God. Chapter 17, uh, John is taken by the spirit into the wilderness and he sees uh, uh, the, what we call the harlot. And so in a book that encourages faithfulness to God, here's um, someone or a group of someone who have not been faithful. The language of scripture, they've prostituted themselves um, with evil. And so we kind of see evil revealed and dealt with. And then in Revelation chapter 21, we find the fourth and final vision where John is taken up to uh, a mountain and he sees the bride of Christ. And so the church, finally made perfect and whole, he sees um, presented before Jesus, the bride, the new Jerusalem, and that's how the book comes to a conclusion. But the first vision John receives in the book begins in verse 10, and it is of the Son, Jesus Christ the Son, the Son of God. And as we're going to see, it's a picture entirely different than the one that hung over uh, the church doors where I grew up. And so let's look at this vision together here, Revelation 1, verse 10 We're going to read through the end of the chapter in verse 20. And so I would encourage you all, let's stand together um, out of respect for God's word and to receive this um, vision of Jesus that John sees. We saw last week, Revelation promises blessing over those who read the word aloud. So we're making it a goal to read through this book as we teach through it uh, aloud together. So verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That's the, the marker of one of the new visions. The spirit, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And he says, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, it's not our Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then verse 12, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forever, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. It's the word of the Lord. Amen. You may have a seat. A lot to take uh, in here at the end of chapter one. Don't worry, we will talk about uh, most, uh, if not all of it. Our passage begins with John saying he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That is on Sunday, the Lord's day being Sunday. Uh, John, again, he's a prisoner on this island because of his belief in Jesus. And so on this particular Sunday, John is either having this private moment of worship while he's on the island Or if there are other prisoners around, he may be kind of leading them in a a corporate gathering of worship. But what we see, just as kind of a quick aside, is that even as John goes through difficulty, he makes space for worship. And that really is a a pretty strong uh, example for, for us. You may be able to think about a time in your life, some of you, when you were going through something terrible, you would never want to go through it again. But as you look back, you realize the only way that you were able to make through that trial was by worship. You would have to come uh, into either, you know, this space or even in your own private time, you would put your circumstances in the proper perspective in light of who God is. And as you worship God for who he is, you were able to see a little more clearly and find the strength you needed to go through uh, your circumstances. This is what John is doing here while he's on uh, the island. He's doing it, maybe leading others through it as well. And as he worships and he gets his heart and his self in tune with who God is, he hears a voice speak to him like thunder that says, write down what you see. 
In verse 12, he says, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, we'll talk about that, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. So, we, so John, he's, he's doing something, like he's worshiping, he's leading people in worship, and it says when he hears the voice, it must be behind him in some way because he turns around, and when he turns around, he says he sees these seven, these seven lampstands. And we're told at the end of the chapter, and we'll see this also next week, that these seven lampstands represent uh, the seven historical churches to whom the book was written. And we're told who those churches are. But they're represented here. Again, this is an apocalypse. So he sees them as lampstands, and he kind of, he's looking for the voice. But the first thing he sees are the lampstands. So he's like, who's the one who's speaking to me? And then as he sees walking among the lampstands, one who looks like a son of man. That's Jesus walking amidst the the churches. And so just an observation of John's experience, because John's experience is a lot like ours. People see the church before they see the Savior. People see the church before they see the Savior. Most of us don't come to know Jesus until we are, until we know and are known within a community of faith. And so somehow we get connected to a group of believers, people who are living out their faith through the messiness of life, the messiness of relationships, and that church becomes the window through which we come to faith in Christ. This was true in John's day, it's true all the way to our day, that the church remains the most common way people come to believe. And I don't know about you, but I find that both uh, sobering and also encouraging. I find it sobering because I know how far I fall short of Jesus. And I, and I know probably as well as almost anyone else here how far our, ch- how far our church falls short of, of Jesus. I imagine in a room this size of people with us online and on television, there are, there are several people uh, in our midst who have been hurt by a community of faith, maybe even hurt badly. Church, church hurt is a real thing. And if you've experienced that uh, somewhere, here, somewhere else, like I, I want you to hear me say that I'm, I'm terribly sorry. That can be really difficult to work through. And so I hope that you find uh, this to be a safe place where you can, uh, you can come, especially if this has happened recently. You can come, maybe be anonymous for a little while, um, listen, connect with God, and kind of figure out what it is that God has for you next. Uh, that next step for you in your relationship with him and connection to a a local church. I hope you find this to be a safe place that you're welcomed and you're loved, but you need to know, even then, like, we're we're not a perfect place either. Like, we hurt one another from time to time. And if you've been here long enough, you've probably hurt somebody, you've probably been hurt one time or another. It's been said, if you ever find a perfect church, you know, tongue in cheek, don't join it because you'll ruin it or you'll learn that it wasn't a perfect place to begin with. Like, we just all have baggage that keeps us from reflecting Christ as he deserves. And that's the sobering part of this reality that people often see the church before they actually come to see and know Jesus. But the encouraging part about this is in spite of our shortcomings, people still come to know Jesus through the church as as we worship, as we open up God's word and we teach, um, as we receive communion and we love one another and we serve outside of these walls in the community, like people will see and experience our life together and they will come to know and they will come to, to love Christ. Like that's part of the beautiful and mysterious plan uh, that God has for uh, his people. And so John, John sees the churches first and then he kind of works through and he sees the voice speaking to him and he describes him like, like a son of man. Now son of man is an Old Testament Term And something that's really important for us to understand and to tuck away through the whole series is that Revelation pulls the majority of its language and images and symbolism from the Old Testament. Eugene Peterson offers us some helpful perspective. I, I tell you, I've not done the math here. Like, I've not gone through and actually checked his, his stats, but they're, they're either um, right or very close. But he says this. He says, Revelation has 404 verses. In those 404 verses, there are 518 references to earlier scripture. He says, these statistics post a warning. No one has any business reading the last book who has not read the previous 65. 
Every line of the Revelation is mined out of rich strata of Scripture laid down in earlier ages. Now, what he's saying is if we miss the influence of the Old Testament on Revelation, we will miss the significance of the book. This, in fact, is one of the reasons why Revelation is so challenging for us today because there are probably, um, unfortunately, very few or, or a small number, I don't want to say very few, a smaller number of Christians who actually um, have a good grasp of the Old Testament and uh, the messages and the language within it. And so it can make it difficult. But John sees this son of man, it's an Old Testament term, and he describes him with seven characteristics. And so let me remind you of the seven characteristics that he's said. You can count them with me if you want. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool and snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters. Uh, in his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. This is nothing like the photo I showed you of Jesus earlier, right, that hung over uh, the church where I grew up. And notice the text says Jesus, he looked like these things. John doesn't say that Jesus is these things. Like, he looks and he sees one like this. Again, Revelation is an apocalypse, so signs and symbols to communicate a point, to show us what's going on underneath. Sometimes an artist will take all of these um, descriptions and they'll throw it into a picture as if to say, boom, this is, what G this is what John saw. And that can be helpful, but more important even than imagining what it is that John sees here, we are to recognize and feel the weight of the words. Like what is he communicating here? And so this passage is revealing who Jesus is truly is underneath. It is an apocalypse, an unveiling. And so I want to look at these descriptions briefly, one at a time. Again, these come from the Old Testament. It starts by saying, hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. Now, the Son of Man language is in the Old Testament several times, but most notably in Daniel, the Old Testament book of Daniel. And in Daniel, the Son of Man refers to uh, a promised one who's going to come, the Messiah, and he's going to establish God's kingdom and it's going to overtake all earthly kingdoms, and God's kingdom is never going to be shaken. And that's, that's Jesus. And so John here, he sees Jesus walking like a, like a son of man, hearkening this uh, title from the Old Testament. But in that same chapter of Daniel, we also read about the Ancient of Days. He's a figure with hair white as wool who sits in judgment over the earth, uh, the one who is and who was and who is to come. So this refers to God Almighty. So in Daniel, we see the Son of Man and we see God Almighty. And here, Jesus is pictured both ways. So Jesus is, he's human, he's the Son of Man, but he's also, he's also we're told, divine. Right? He's the Ancient of Days. And so on the human side, Jesus, he gets us because he came to walk among us and understand what we go through. We talked about this a lot at Christmas, right? The incarnation of Christ, he understands what we go through. Um, he can encourage us, like there's no temptation which we can't bear because Jesus knows what it's like. But as God, Jesus also has perspective that we need. White hair, even today, denotes wisdom, uh, perspective. And because of this wisdom, Jesus has the right to, to judge. Now, I, I got my hair cut Thursday. And after I got it cut, I looked down uh, before I got up and I noticed on the, the, the gown there were a lot more white hairs than I, than I used to see. And so I just, I thought about kind of, you know, the 10 years since we've been here, and I thought, I thought I'm a lot wiser than when I showed up here 10 years ago. I look a lot more like Jesus than I did, uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago. But like, even today, white, white hair, wisdom, perspective. And so we see Jesus as one who can judge. He has this hair like wool and snow. Second, eyes like a flame of fire. Fire in the Old Testament um, is, is frequently a, a signal of, of purity and of holiness. And so John sees Jesus. He like makes eye contact with him and he feels like Jesus is just gonna burn a hole right through him. He's so holy. He's so pure. Have, have you heard the phrase like her eyes you know, burned a hole into my soul or, or he saw right through me? Well, this is what John feels here with Jesus. Like, and, and in our sin, Jesus' gaze would be our end if not for grace. John stands here, and he just, for a moment, he sees Jesus in, in all of his holiness, and he just feels like, like, I can hardly even 
look at him. He's so beyond me or anything else. John feels that, eyes like flame of fire. We're told Jesus has feet like burnished bronze. A bronze may be uh, a tip of the cap to uh, the temple because we're told Jesus is walking among the lampstands like the priests would have done in the Old Testament and the temple um, involved bronze. So some people think this is kind of like Jesus walking in the temple. But we're told here that the, his feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And so the focus here is, is more on the refining. Bronze glows, um, burns as it's held to heat. And we're told here Jesus' what looked like burnished bronze. His, his feet glow like burnished bronze. Where is Jesus walking when John sees this vision? He, he's walking among the churches. And we're gonna see next week in the seven letters to these churches that these churches, they're undergoing their own refinement. They're being tested. They're enduring persecution. Like they're going, their circumstances are not easy. They're going through a lot. And as Jesus walks among them, his, fur, his feet um, glow like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And what we see is that even in our suffering, Jesus walks with us. Jesus feels our struggles. He um, experiences our testing in a personal way. And we may leave Jesus when hard times come, but Jesus will never leave us. Right? He suffers with us. He suffers for us. Uh, his feet were like burnished bronze. His voice like the roar of many waters. When Jesus speaks, uh, it's just, it's awe-inspiring. And John gets a sense of that. Um, I don't know, I, I've been by some small waterfalls in my lifetime, like, you know, maybe in, ten in Tennessee or something like that. I've never stood next to Niagara Falls. Has anyone ever stood next to a waterfall like that, Niagara Falls, and just the rush of the water? I imagine you can't even hear yourself think, like certainly even to hold a, a conversation. Uh, John, just Jesus' voice is like this, or if you would like to go to the ocean, the ocean current, uh, knock you over if you're not careful, the waves crashing upon the shore, sweep you out to, to sea. Uh, I think I told this story once before, but when Sarah and I got married, our plan was to drop, for our honeymoon was to drive, you know, kind of up the East Coast and to make it to Maine. And we were going to spend a few days in Maine and kind of drive our way back down. Uh, we had a family member who had a connection to a place to stay in Maui, and they said, actually, the person who owned it was going to let us stay for a few days for free. And this family member offered to buy our plane tickets if we just would take care of our expenses while we were there. So we, you know, we thought about it for a minute and said, sign us up, right? We'll, we'll go to Maine you know, some other time. It's, you know, it'll be 15 years this summer. We've still never been to Maine. So, um, so we, fly out, we fly out to Maui. And I, I like to go to the ocean. Um, you know, some people love it. I like to go. I, I feel like I have what I call a healthy respect of the ocean. Like, I enjoy it, but I'm also slightly afraid of it, like just the power that John talks about here. And that was around the time when um, tsunamis were getting more into the public conscious, like there had been a few that had happened, and so at least in my mind, people were talking about them more. And I was very aware as I was on this island, like you, you, you can feel it, you're looking out at just water all around. And so uh, one day, I remember driving up the coast to the other side of the island, and the, the water came up, the road was kind of on the top of the, this little rock face, and the water's coming down here, and um, beautiful water here, and kind of mountains over here, and we drive out in the daylight, but we come back, it's nighttime, and what I didn't think about was that the tide was going to come in, and so the water would, you know, come up even more to that, you know, that rock face, and so we're driving through at night, pitch dark, and um, a little bit anxious, again, because of the whole tsunami thing. And all of a sudden, some of the mist and water from the, the, the waves crashing up the side flashed up over the side and landed on our windshield, Psh, like hit the windshield. And I thought I was going to meet this Jesus right then. <laughs> I, I can't believe I didn't drive off the road, you know, even though it was just a little splash, because I thought, we are going to, like, it was great being married to you for five days, but it's over, you know, now we're going to meet, we're going to meet Christ. But Jesus' voice is, has this kind of power. And that's why we take the word of God seriously. You know, Isaiah speaks to those who tremble at God's word. And that, that really is an appropriate response. Trembling at the word of God. We see Jesus' voice like the roar of many waters. Uh, his right hand held seven stars. This is the only one of the seven features where we are, we are directly told the meaning at the end of the, the chapter. And so the seven stars represent seven 
Uh, we'll talk about it more next week. Angels or seven, or seven messengers to the churches. And Jesus holds these stars in his hands, so uh, he controls the, the message. He directs the messengers as he sees fit. Jesus won't let the preacher run off with his own crazy ideas for too long. Um, he won't let them stand, or th- them stand on their soapbox for too long before he corrects them. Like, this is God's word, not the pastor's. And it's difficult for a preacher because any preacher will tell you in some ways, like, your, you know, your personality and who you are comes through also when you're preaching. But again, this is not, this is God's word, not our word to tinker with. Jesus controls the message. And he even here at the end, he's going to reach down and pick John up with his right hand because John's a messenger of Jesus. And John's going to speak on Jesus' behalf in this book. And and John has to speak what Jesus directs him to say because he holds the seven stars. He controls the message. Out of his mouth comes this two-edged sword, number six. Hebrews speaks of the word of God uh, being a double-edged sword that divides soul and spirit, uh, joint and marrow. The Old Testament speaks of God's word cutting like a sword. Uh, If you think about to their day, this is when the church was still living amidst Rome as kind of a superpower. So you think of like the emperor either Um, Some people think maybe Nero was in charge when this book was written. Some say uh, it was 30 or 40 years later when Domitian was in charge. Either way, an emperor in that day would have a message in their mouth and a sword in their hand. Propaganda that they were going to put forth and then an army that they could use to enact their plans. Jesus has the opposite. Jesus has a message in his hand, we just saw, and he has a sword in his mouth. It's the exact difference. His word is the only weapon that he needs. Right? The living God has no need for tanks and armies and nuclear bombs. Like he has, a, he has a word as a weapon. It's a word of judgment. It's a word of grace. It's a word of blessing and repentance and hope. It hits us at the deepest places of who we are and divides soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It's the only weapon Jesus needs. As a side note, it's the only weapon that the church needs. Like his, his word is his weapon. Out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. And then seven, his face shines like the sun in full strength. If if, if you were to look directly at Jesus, if John were to look directly at him, he would go blind. He's so holy and glorious. I was thinking about how to capture these descriptions. This one actually was the easiest one for me because it took me back to elementary school and middle school when, when the eclipse would come through. And uh, whenever there's an eclipse, of course, teachers would take their students out, and you're describing what's happening, and, uh, you know, and they take you out to get a, a sense of it, and they put the fear of God into you at first. They're like, don't look, you can't look directly at the eclipse, like, even though it's going to seem dark and it's going to get cool, like, you don't look directly at the sun. I don't even know if this is what happens, but they tell you, like, it's burn a hole in your retinas, or, you know, you're going to go blind, but you can't look at it. But then they, but then they give you, like, these five-cent sunglasses that are like a millimeter, like a millimeter thick, and then they go, okay, now you can look at it. And I'm just like, you just told me, like, why the, I'm not trusting my eyes to these little flimsy sunglasses, but John's standing there, and it's almost like they, they give me sunglasses, and he looks, and he's like, I can't even, like, I can't even look at Jesus. I'm gonna go, bl- I'm gonna go blind. You wore sunglasses before driving down the street, and like the sun hits him, like you just, even in the sunglasses, you can't see And John has this experience with Jesus. His face shines like the sun in full strength and is overwhelming to him. If you were to see Jesus as he's revealed here, eyes of fire, feet aglow, sword shooting out of his mouth, voice like Niagara Falls, how, how how would you respond? What would you do with yourself? Would you, would you give him a high five? Hey, Jesus, what's up? You know, what's up, bro? Like, how you doing? Good, 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 good to see you. Would you, would you sing him? Would you sing him a song? Like, get the pitch key out and just get the pitch just right, and then offer him a song. Would you ask him a theological question? I've been wondering about this for a long time, Jesus. Can we talk about this part of Scripture? Or maybe you, maybe you tell him some of the things you think he's gotten wrong in your life or in the world. But I expect we would respond more as John. Does Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Now, we might imagine that when we get to heaven and we see Jesus, like sometimes people will say, I'm, 
you know, I'm gonna find my old friend who passed away before me or I'm gonna go fishing with granddad or even talk with Jesus about the bone that I have to pick with him. And sometimes those things are serious, like, you know, why did I get cancer? Or why did I, why did I lose, why did you lose not, not just one, but two or three children? I'm gonna talk to him about this, but, but the odds are each of us, before anything else, just like John, will bow in wonder and adoration. Like we think we may come with an agenda, but truth is we'll come into Christ's presence with, with awe and maybe even a little trembling. And may fall down before him as though dead. And that's what makes the next, what comes next so remarkable. I love the second half of that verse. John falls down as though dead, but he says, he, Jesus, laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of death in Hades. This, this is what's so beautiful about Jesus, though he is so much more glorious and holy than we are, he doesn't leave us groveling in our sin. And he doesn't leave us cowering in fear. Instead, he reaches down, he picks us up, and he says, there is nothing for you to be afraid of. There is nothing for you to be afraid of. I am the first and the last. I was there in the beginning of everything. I'm gonna be there at the end of all things. There is nothing that you're gonna see in this life that I've not seen myself. I'm the first and the, the last. He says, I died and I came back. There's nothing you'll experience in life I haven't conquered up to the point of death. I died and I've come back. I'm alive and I hold the keys of death in Hades, right? He's got the keys. No one departs from this life apart from my allowance and there is no one who will stay dead should I, desi- should I raise them. Like I, I have the, the keys. Death is not the devil's domain any longer. He answers to me. I have the, the keys. This is the picture we have of Jesus, a picture of Jesus reigning over everything. So no matter what you're facing, what we find in the opening of Revelation is if you know this Jesus, you have literally nothing to be afraid of. Like what on this earth could possibly hurt you that Jesus can't heal? And what can someone take from you that Jesus cannot return? Like if you know this Jesus, like not, not the watered down version that gives you what you want and fulfills all your desires, like if you know this Jesus, if, if you don't know him, Revelation is gonna deal with that later in the book. But if you know this Jesus, you can trust no matter what might happen in this life, it doesn't have the last word, he does. And in a sense, that's the message of the whole book. He's alive, Jesus is alive, he holds the keys of death in Hades, fear not, like he's already won. We said last week, the last vision of the book isn't a victorious Jesus. We meet him in chapter one. It's chapter one. He's already defeated hell and death. We get to the end of the book and we see the victorious bride, the victorious church made perfect and whole in Christ. And so just in conclusion this morning, if you read Revelation and you wind up scared uh, about anything other than Jesus, if you wind up scared, you're reading it wrong. We read Revelation and we're to walk away emboldened. Not in our strength, because our strength fails us. And not in the ease of our circumstances. We'll see next week the circumstances of the churches or anything, but easy. But we take courage in Jesus' voice of cascading waters. We find strength in his word, perspective in his wisdom, humility as we stare into his face. We find courage knowing that he walks among us and he suffers for us. And we find boldness in the fact that he has power even over the grave. This is the picture John sees of Jesus. Like, this is Jesus unveiled, right? Apocalypse. He's been revealed. And hallelujah for it. Amen. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this picture of Jesus because it is one that we uh, in this world desperately need. We uh, don't always see him this way. We can see maybe parts of who he is or we may in a particular moment, want something from him and see him as a dispenser of blessing. But Jesus deserves our worship. Uh, He is so above and beyond us, and yet he reaches down and he uh, engages us, and he picks us up, he makes us whole, and he offers us, Lord, all that he has. He says it belongs to his children. And so thank you, God, for his wisdom, his power, his grace. And we lean into that this morning, whatever it is we may be going through. Give us, Lord, perspective of our circumstances in light of who you are, just as you did for John when he had this 
this view of him and help us leave with this full picture of who Christ is. We pray in Jesus' name and everybody said